Facebook page. My name is Chris Spangle. I am the host of We Are Libertarians. And uh, we are going to talk about the Supreme Court tonight. I'm here with Abdul Hakim Shabazz. Uh, and very excited to talk to him. I'm just sharing some stuff. So okay, because I'm looking for me yeah. on your Facebook page. Uh, I'm getting ready to share it to my page. Um, let's see, share. Just getting set up here, sorry, sorry. Live on, we are with Abdul. All right. So we are going to talk about the Supreme Court tonight and the uh, Supreme Court pick Brett Kavanaugh. So make Welcome sure that to the you're swamp. St- yeah. <laughs> make sure every I can hear everybody. Kavanaugh. So make Welcome sure that to the you're st- swamp. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Make sure every I can hear everybody. Kavanaugh. So make Welcome sure. Th- th- there we go. <laughs> Pick. Oh, there we are. Okay. Almost. The there. challenge is for, for is for me to be to look at you and talk to you and not and look not, at and not look at myself. Not, not stare at yourself. Yes. <laughs> I know. The struggle is real. First world problems. Right. All right. Now, now since they're on the Facebook page, this is when you should say the taxation is theft thing. That'll really make their heads explode on the Facebook page. Okay, let's start this all right now. <laughs> taxation is not theft. <laughs> Government is actually a necessary entity. And if you want to be a political party, you need to start acting like one and not a social club. It, yes, Harry changed. Harry looks different. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, because Harry is my my co-host. So you are. I always joke that you're my uh, establishment friend. That's right. And with he, capital E. And you're gonna de- you're gonna uh, defend the establishment tonight. So it's gonna be. So I'm putting it on the big Facebook page simply for the contentious nature that the comment section will be. Alrighty, awesome. Looking forward to it. You're gonna be. You're gonna be to stir a lot of trouble up. All right. Here we go. That didn't work out like I wanted it to. All right, we're going in dry. Welcome to Story Weird- of my life. <laughs> my little sound machine isn't working. Oh, I know why. There we go. Jeez, it's like the old days, Abdul. Well, He's- at least you're here at on time and not late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back in the good old days, I was Abdul's producer, and I was not good at it. It, it took a while for you to learn the ropes. <laughs> Roughly but, but, four years. Four years, but you've done very well for yourself. I'm very proud of thank, you. Thank you. All right, here we go. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and we are live from the We Are Libertarian studios here in beautiful Indianapolis, Indiana. I am joined tonight by uh, my... Longtime friend and mentor, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, uh, proprietor of IndiePolitics.org, and all-around troublemaker. You're on WIBC Radio. Uh, ha- a- Abdul, how would you how would you describe your ideological bent? This music is really loud in my ear. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, here, here. I'll turn that off for you, sir. There we go. Yes, and Christy, please feel free to share. We're we're live and on the big page tonight just because Abdul's going to make all of their heads explode. And I've also shared you on my page as well. Excellent. Good times. So how would you say, Abdul, uh, your ideological bent comes down? I'm a socially progressive capitalist pig. Okay. That would be about the best way I can describe it. All right. Love the capitalism, love the freedom, love the individual liberty, but also coupled with that individual liberty is things like personal responsibility. And there are some things we do have to pay for, and there are some things that government does have to do, like roads and bridges and infrastructure. Uh, so I have been redecorating the studio with a bunch of paraphernalia for my many years. You know, being a reporter with Abdul for about four years, going to Republican and Democratic uh, things, I've collected Republican and Democrat buttons and tchotchkes, my years in the Libertarian uh, movement, got all kinds of things. I, I- to talk to you about your flair. I have a lot of flair everywhere uh, in the studio as we've redesigned, 
and uh, on the table, I've put some bumper stickers under the clear plastic uh, cover, and one of them is taxation is theft, and you sat down and you immediately went, what the f- Yeah, taxation is not theft. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is not. It's called the price you pay for civilization. People have been paying taxes since people have been here because there are certain things we have to pay for, like the roads we drove on and like the sewers that flushed the waste in the bathroom. There are certain things you got to pay for. Now, we can argue how much it costs. I think that's a fair mm-hmm. question. We can also argue, you know, is this the most efficient use you know, of our tax dollars during this particular event? But taxation is not theft. It is the price you pay for civilization. People need to move on. I want to refute that, but I also just want to sit and watch the comments because the, all their heads are exploding. Uh, so so it, it's, sa- it's safe to say that you believe in the government and the role of government, and you're not an anarcho-capitalist. You believe in the free market, but you do believe that government should have some role in polite society. Yes, I believe that government is more like an umpire in a baseball game. Your job is to call the balls and the strikes, but otherwise you let the players play, and if somebody charges the mound, you throw them out of the game. So how do you jive that with your free market principles? Easy, because the free market isn't totally free. I mean, we don't let people rip people off and engage in consumer fraud. Mm-hmm. We have protections for that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. No, we don't do child labor in this country. So we do have a free market, but even the free market has limitations. I'm just watching the comment section. They're going crazy. You're going to have to go go to our We Are Libertarians Facebook page and uh, feel free to uh, refute Abdul if you'd like. Uh, that is not why we are here tonight. I'm, I am always happy to tell people that they are wrong and show them the error of their ways. You, I'm, not, I'm not doing this to be condescending and smug. Well, I, I sort of kind of am. You called me condescending and smug before we sat down. Because I'm so proud of you. I know. I learned it all from you. <laughs> uh, you yeah, that's uh, Ron Rice makes a good point. There were roads before there were taxes, sir. People, Where? people built roads. For instance, Churchman Avenue here in Indianapolis. Mr. Churchman built the road himself as he was uh, he built had built and a where farm. Did, and where did Mr. Churchman get his money? Let me finish. Mr. Churchman, who was a banker, comments are really going crazy now. Uh, so I must be on the wrong page because I'm watching We Are Libertarians live. I'm only seeing Paul Copeland say "re." No, uh, you're probably in the in the group. You want to go to the big page? Click through to that. Yeah. Now. Mr. Churchman was a banker in the 1800s. Ah, there we go. Yeah, and he lived in uh, Beach Grove, and he worked in downtown Indianapolis, and then he built a road for he, his carriage, and Fountain Square was a stop for his horses. He built a fountain to water his horses. He's the one who built Churchman Avenue. And when did he build Churchman Avenue? What year was that? Um, 18, it was, in the, it was after the Civil War. What year is it now? It's 2018. Thank you, it's, and we're done talking. It's current year. Yeah, thank right. you. Let's see Mr. Churchman build I-65. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I, I'm going to turn down my volume because I'm hearing me I, <laughs> after I hear me, and that kind of creeps me out. <laughs> that is one of your criticisms of libertarian thought is that libertarians, when you have these kind of arguments, they always jump back to the antebellum era. <laughs> yeah. And newsflash, not a big fan. Right. I wonder why. So you, you may see uh, why I became a libertarian, uh, because I was working with Abdul, and I just parroted everything that Rush Limbaugh ever said, and Abdul picked every single part of it apart. Uh, now, and that is because your background is what? Well, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. Well, first of all, let me start, go back. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in broadcast journalism, mm-hmm. television, radio, newspaper, that sort of thing. Uh, after doing that, after graduate, I went to work at a radio station in Bloomington, Illinois, just 152 miles right. east of where we are here on I-74, one of those roads that the tax <laughs> paid for. Right. Uh, was a reporter for a couple of years and decided to go to grad school. I love covering government and politics. I got my master's from the University of Illinois in public affairs and public affairs reporting. Went back to being a reporter, covered the Illinois legislature, which basically meant I was a crime reporter and hung out at the county jail <laughs> right. all the time. After I was doing that for about a year and a half, and then I got approached by the Illinois Attorney General. They were looking for somebody to take care of all their downstate media. And in Illinois, downstate is defined by anything outside of the Chicago metropolitan area. Right. And so I did that for a while, uh, for eight years. And while working for the Attorney General, finally decided to go to law school. I had a chance to go after undergraduate. I was like, but like a lot of people, you know, I'm tired of sitting in the classroom all day, want to get out, real life, go make some real money. Went to work for the attorney general during the day, went to law school at night, and was a part-time disc jockey on the weekends. Right. Got my law degree, went back to, I graduated in 03, ironically, which is when the economy kind of went south, and nobody was really moving out of law firms, because you have a certain amount of attrition that, you know, people are getting ready to retire, they will leave, and younger guys come in. 
But because the economy was going south, the older guys were sticking around longer, so you didn't have that kind of movement. So I went back to being a talk show host full-time and did lawyering on the side. Then I got the opportunity. A mutual friend of ours, Mr. Andrew Lee, Mm -hmm. reached out to me and said, hey, we've got an opening here at WXNT Radio in Indianapolis. Are you interested? Like X and T, X and T. So I went to the early days of the internet and my <laughs> 5600 baud modem and, <laughs> and saw the little lines kind of go across the screen as it came up. Like, okay, what the hell is this? Like, all right, sure, I'll try anything. Once, I mean, it is one of the largest, you know, 12th largest cities in America. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Right. Next thing you know, I did the audition. They hired me. I was only supposed to be for a couple of years, but the girl I was dating at the time in Springfield broke up with me, ironically, the day that Christopher Reeve died. Super. <laughs> Uh, Abdul's why, a big Superman yeah, fan. Which why I show you my Superman tattoo, but black people having tattoos is like sky riding at night, <laughs> and so you'd never see it right as as clear as you should. And so like, oh, well, we'll just stick right here for a couple more years. And I met the future lovely Mrs. Shabazz at the time. At the, at the time, she was she who shall be nameless because mm-hmm. I was not putting my girlfriend in the middle of all that nonsense that but, I have to deal with on a regular basis. Totally, totally understand. Yeah, yeah. And one day she was actually a guest on the show. She brought cookies. Right. And, but my wife did not realize that the microphone is always on. Like, so you can't just talk and blurt out <laughs> yeah, d- stuff. Well, that, that's been the, uh, the way that you've been successful, though, is you just open up the microphone and start <laughs> blurting things out. Yeah, but that's my job. Right, okay. <laughs> like, sweetheart, you're just visiting. Uh, then we got married, got married in 2009, and we're coming up on our ninth wedding anniversary. Ironically, you met your future spouse, and I met my future spouse in the same week. Yes, and you are la- still together, are still married, which fri- surprises quite a few people. Right. See, my wife and I, we have a deal. Uh, divorce is never an option. Mm-hmm. Murder, however, <laughs> is always on the table. <laughs> well, plus, that- I re- plus, I refuse to leave my wife because I have no desire to see her happy. <laughs> she's a lovely woman. She's a patient woman. Extremely patient. She's a saint. Yes, she is. Uh, so I met Abdul in 2004. I became his intern for a few months and then stuck around the station and eventually became his producer for about a year in 2007. It was a great experience for me because I got to cover all the presidential campaigns of 2007, 2008, where you know I saw all, all of them. Hillary, Obama, you know, Bill... Uh, Mike Huckabee, Mike Huck- Huckabee Lee, yeah. John McCain, they all because they all came through. Yeah, they all came through Indiana. And what's funny is back in I want to say it was like the summer of '07 when the presidential candidates are starting to, you know, come out of the come out of the woodwork and announce their exploratory committees. I was at a forum. It was a Midwest Republican Governors Association. I was on a panel along with Fred Barnes, who used to write for the New Republic, and uh, our good friend Robert Vane and Ari Fleischer, who was a former spokesperson for George W. Bush. And so one of the questions was, who do you see as you know the person that Republicans should look out for? And people were saying the usual people, like Hillary Clinton, right. John Edwards. And I was like, well, actually, guys, if I were you, I'd pay attention to the Barack Obama guy. Right. Because I covered him in Illinois. And that guy, you may not like his politics, but he is a shrewd political operative. He beat the Illinois Democrat establishment, first as a state senator and then as a U.S. senator. So that's the guy that I look out for because you can't do all the old – you know, grainy footage and O.J. Simpson type <laughs> pictures and the, or the menacing Negro guy who wants to do whatever. That's, right. that's not going to work and not going to fly. And everybody thought it was crazy. Next thing you know, January 20th, 2009, I, Barack Hussein Obama, do <laughs> solemnly swear. Well, I saw him speak at my alma mater, Plainfield High School, and he was, he was uh, I think part of the appeal of uh, was that he, you didn't know who he was, you didn't know anything about him. And he came out of nowhere, and so you go and you hear, hear him speak, and you're like, wow, he's going to heal us all racially. He really is an amazing speaker. This this guy might might have it. He might be like a great centrist hope. Uh, and so I thought about Barack Obama because at the time I was politically homeless for about a month and a half, and then I came to my senses because I realized, like, n- what am I thinking? Like, this guy is far center left. Um you 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 were a little less tough on Barack Obama. Uh, I mean, how did you think that he ended up doing as president? I thought there were a lot. I thought he did, for the most part, okay. And I know this is going to make, once again, everybody's head explode. But you have to look at where do people start and where do they finish. Right. And when Barack Obama became president, we're in the middle of the greatest economic meltdown since the Great Depression. Right. And to go from a universe of you know hundreds of thousands of jobs hemorrhaging every day to... Well, I want to say the unemployment rate when he left office was about 4%. It was back in double digits. Presidents get the, get the blame or they get the credit 
when it when it's on their watch. I give Donald credit, Donald Trump credit. I mean, hey, it's his economy is under his watch. He gets the credit. If it goes south, he gets the blame. I do the same thing with Barack Obama. Right. Plus, I could never dog a fellow Chicagoan. That's just a, <laughs> just don't do that. A black lawyer from the south side of Chicago had a special place in your heart. Yeah, and I'm not talking about my sister. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to have Abdul on. Uh, yes, I know he's a dirty statist, and I know that he loves roads, and he doesn't think taxation is theft. Okay, one like second here. This person, Reinhold, Uh-oh. who just made a comment, he said getting his primary competition out of the picture by having the guy's wife, Jerry Ryan, accuse him of being a sex fiend didn't hurt. That is wrong because uh, just to give you guys a little bit of backstory, the Republican nominee uh, back in 2004 for the Senate was a guy named Jack Ryan. Right. Jack Ryan was an uh, investment financier, covered his campaign. Actually, we had a really good relationship, much like I do with a lot of elected officials. Mm-hmm. You know, statuses are us. And <laughs> the problem was, was there was a question about uh, his, his divorce because he was married to Jerry Ryan, 7 of 9, and the old Star Trek Voyager. Right. And there were allegations that she made against him that were not very flattering. He would take her to sex clubs and have her perform, et cetera, et cetera. And I recall it was actually, as a matter of fact, it'll be 14 years next month running into when the story was starting to break because the Chicago Tribune was trying to get access to his divorce records. Right. And so we're, we're having this conversation back and forth. I'm like, say, Jack, how's it going? It's like, it's going okay. It's like, well, let me tell you something. Here's some just friendly advice. If I were you, I would not fight the release of my divorce records. What I would say is you guys want to see him? Fine. In my divorce, and any divorced man or divorced woman or married somebody who has been divorced can sympathize with this. My ex-wife made some allegations against me. The judge heard her side of the story, heard my side of the story, and he gave me custody of our 12-year-old son. Right. That is all you had to say. He's like, nope, there's nothing in there. And then all the stuff comes out, and then he has to step down and resign. But and it, then didn't they put in Alan Keyes and then that, Bra- Bra- that, that idiot... Yes. <laughs> Barack walked walked away with it basically. That Negro got beat down like he was at thirty fifth and King Drive. You 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 I've never seen you don't get mad at much. But when people would say that you look like Alan Keyes. I found that morally offensive. <laughs> you were so like the local sheriff in Indianapolis at one point was like trying to arrest you yes. for blogging. Like and you were like, Ah, whatever. Call you Alan Keyes, my now, God. Now we're now we're gonna have a fight. Right. And, and see, the thing was, and I, and I go back and jokingly say that was kind of my Forrest Gump moment in American right. politics. <laughs> right. Because had Jack Ryan listened to me, he would have probably have won the U.S. Senate race. Right. Barack Obama is not president. Right. So theoretically, then all the things we had over the past 10 years or so would not have existed. So theoretically, I'm kind of technically responsible. <laughs> you the, would the, take credit. The, the only thing missing is me walking over to the window at the Watergate Hotel and calling the security guard saying, hey, I, someone's in the lights <laughs> on over there. I'm trying to sleep. All right, so let's talk about the Supreme Court, because uh, I solicited questions, and, and we'd love for you in the comments to ask questions as they come along, as they relate to the Supreme Court, because this is a branch of government that people just don't seem to understand much about. We understand a lot about the presidency. We understand about the agencies that report to the presidency. We have some awareness of Congress and committees, and you know we saw the bill and the cartoon dancing on the steps, but the Supreme Court really seems to be one of those... Uh, murky pieces. The judiciary is really I, I slipped into what was that uh, uh, Sunday talk show host? The judiciary, uh, <laughs> the McLaughlin yeah. report. Wrong, uh, wrong. Uh, and so the ju- the judiciary is something that not a lot of people totally understand. And with uh, Brett Kavanaugh's pick yesterday, uh, it's going to come up a lot. So I want to I want to answer your questions about it, but want to talk about Brett Kavanaugh a little bit. Uh, he seems to be a, he, you know, Ben Shapiro said it was a double, not a home run. They were all, the social conservatives were rooting for Amy Barrett, seven kids, Catholic woman. You know, instead they got the Catholic nice family man who looks like Alex P. Keaton. Uh, just gave this speech who he's, he they call him the Forrest Gump because he was at Ken Starr. And then he was in the White yep, House at 9-11. And then he's on the Supreme Court. Um, so, and he was a judge in the Obamacare, the ACA. So he's kind of been, uh, at a lot of foundational moments in modern history. Uh, and by all accounts, very smart guy, went to Yale, uh, very swampy, worked in the Bush White House. He is, he is the epitome of the swamp. Right. Which is the which is, what, which is the irony of the whole, right. the whole thing. Which politically, I don't understand why 
Trump didn't just go for it because they were going to hate whoever he picks. And, you know, Amy Barrett would have politically, in my mind, it would have tweaked the left so far. They would have gone so overboard that you see, he, but but here's the problem with the name would have played into his hands. See, here's the problem with an Amy Barrett pick. She has only been on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals for about a year. Right. And so she really hasn't had necessarily a real track record. And because she's only been on for a year, you give the opposition an easy reason to not confirm her. It's like, right. well, no offense, Mr. President, but she's only been here for a year, hasn't really written necessarily a whole lot of opinions. We don't know where she is on things. Whereas somebody like a Kavanaugh has a, he's been on the Pel- went to DC court, DC circuit for I want to say like twelve years now. Yeah, you no, know, the guy's got a track record, and all and, of and, the in the White House, he has all those emails that are recorded. I mean, so he has a long paper trail, and trust me, the Democrats are going to use that to delay this. But but he also, under, I would argue that of all the picks the president potentially had, Kavanaugh understands the DC process better mm-hmm. than anybody because he was the White House secretary. Now, what does that mean? No, he's not sitting at a desk taking dictation. What he's doing is basically every sheet of paper that came across George W. Bush's desk, he saw. Hmm. I mean, he knows how that process works. He is a known quantity. Now, the curse of a known quantity is you've got an extensive paper trail, but guess what? When your decisions are upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court, you're in a good place. Also, the other part of this equation, too, the New York Times actually did a really good backstory on how the Trump administration convinced Justice Kennedy to step down. Really? Yes. And part of the way they did it was what Justice Kennedy was worried about is, okay, is this guy going to you know, pick somebody that's going to totally just wipe out everything that I've ever... Janine Pirro, for yeah, instance, yeah. from Fox News. Yeah, he's going to do, do, <laughs> do that stuff. And so what the Trump people did was they kind of cut him a deal like, you know, Mr. Chief, Mr. Justice, you know, we will make sure your legacy is protected. And two things they did. Number one... You know that guy named Neil Gorsuch who's on the Supreme Court yeah. now? You know who he was a clerk for? Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. You know who Kavanaugh was a clerk for? Kennedy. Yeah. Several just judges uh, that are now on the federal bench, guess who they clerked for? Kennedy. Ta-da! Right. And so that helps. Also, uh, Kennedy's son and Donald Trump's, one of Donald Trump's sons, actually had a prior relationship. They'd known each other forever. And they had a, because once say Kennedy's son did some, he was like a financier in Europe. And so Trump's kid who did like their international stuff. You know, they were good friends, and so they right. all knew each other. So you can build, you know, those types of relationships. Yeah, the left is claiming that Kennedy bailed some Kennedy's son bailed somebody out, and he's bought and paid for. It's like okay, you know, the the we'll get to the left in a minute, but Why? what Kavanaugh? Yeah, I know Kavanaugh um, and Gorsuch. I think were college roommates. It's, a couple years apart. Yeah, a couple years apart. They wrote they co wrote a book together about uh, judicial precedent. Although it was kind of like a they contributed to this book. Um, so, and Kavanaugh was the second on the short list. Uh, I heard several people, I listened to a bunch of podcasts and read a bunch of stuff today. And I'm not going to pretend that I hadn't heard of Brett. I, I heard of him yesterday. Okay, so I tried to play catch up with this, which is one of the reasons I wanted to have. I don't know if you heard of Brett Kavanaugh before this, but you at least have a, a legal background and kind of can fill in the gaps where I'm missing. Um, Kavanaugh, everybody kind of says he's like a, a a William Rehnquist, he's conservative leaning, but he doesn't want the court to do too much because, you know, like the... Because of, guess what? Activism comes in both the liberal and conservative bent. Yeah, so let's talk about that because what, you know, John Roberts and this concept of minimalism is like the masterpiece cake shops. We're going to take the law as it applies to this case and not make it a broad sweeping opinion. We're going to apply it to this case and rule for this case uh, versus you know, a Roe versus Wade or a a Burgerfell, which is all of the United States. Here's a little secret about judges. And there's a theory, uh, if anyone who's ever practiced law, which is the running joke is you always try to give the judge a reason to rule in your favor if you're the defense that has really nothing to do with the issue at hand. Right. So in the cake case out of Colorado, they never got to whether the baker has to make a cake for a same-sex couple because the baker was just treated so unfairly administratively by right. the you know like by like the I guess the whatever the human rights commission was that it was a it was clearly hostile to the baker's religious beliefs right. and the courts were like no you can't do that they never got to the whole issue of whether the baker has to make a cake for a same sex couple because the guy was just treated so badly and so poorly that we'll rule on this case we don't even have to get to that one. yeah Kennedy said uh, you have to you have to balance religious liberty and you know just liberty for gay couples 
and he was clearly persecuted for his religion by the Colorado right. uh, government, essentially. And so he's like, we're not even going to get to that part because like we don't need to because right. we can do this right here. Right. And and I've always argued, uh, for example, I'm dealing with litigation right now in Cook County, Illinois, right. where, my, where my parents live, because uh, there has been there are a series of stories over the past over the Chicago Tribune has done a great series on the property tax assessment system in Cook County. It is right. just a mess disaster. And what was happening was the people who do the assessments were underassessing downtown commercial property, but to make up for the difference, they would overassess residential neighborhood property, particularly in African Americans and working class and poorer neighborhoods. Right. So imagine, you know, Marion County giving Salesforce Tower a break but then putting that burden on the backs of people who live in Hawville to, to make up the difference. Right. I mean, literally. Yeah. yeah. Sal- Salesforce, major company, Hawville, poor black area. Right. right. Literally, that's what was going on. And so when I saw that, I was like, you know, I think there's something here because there was story after story about the property taxes. I mean, the person was the county assessor, lost the primary to, to another guy. And the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, I think there's something here. And so I went and picked up a copy of the Illinois Constitution, which is the nice thing about having a master's in government <laughs> right. at the University of Illinois. And there is a provision in the Illinois Constitution, as a matter of fact, Article 9, Section 4, because it's <laughs> in my complaint I filed, that says property taxes and assessments shall be fair and reasonable. Right. And I argue there is nothing fair and reasonable about giving the person who was the owner of you know, what used to be called the Sears Tower you know, major property tax breaks. Meanwhile... You know, <clears throat> my dad, who's lived in Cook County all his adult life, is having to pick up the tab. Right. And so I filed a lawsuit declaring Cook County's property tax system violates the Illinois Constitution. Must be a real rough time for the city of uh, Cook County or the county, <laughs> Cook County when uh, Abdul's dad lives there and they start picking on him. Well, that's yeah, exactly because right. that's, that's where he grew up. And so the and when you file a lawsuit, the other side has 30 days to respond to your complaint. And so the Cook County government responded about two weeks ago, because I filed at the end of May, so they responded at the end of June. And their response was not on the merits. Their response was that the plaintiffs in this case should have filed in a different court, because we filed in what's called in Illinois, what's municipal court, and they said it should have been filed in what's called chancery court, because they deal with right. a lot of property-related issues. And so their initial response, by the way, I'm dealing with a very, very nice lady in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. She filed a motion to move it to the court of chancery. Mm-hmm. They didn't even address the the merits of the case. And so my response was, okay, sure, I'm fine. You know, we still, you know, we still think we can get something here on the merits. And so I thought it was interesting that that was their first response was, well, let's go procedurally and not even get to the merits of this because they're scrambling right. trying to figure out what the hell's going on because there have been public statement about how messed up this is, how horrible it is. The Chicago Tribune has, by the way, done a lot of my work already for me. Mm-hmm. And they sent out a freedom of information request compelling the county government to release property tax records. They were trying to hold them back, saying, no, you can't have them. We use them. And the Court of Appeals said, no, give the Chicago Tribune you know, this public information. And what makes it even better is that Cook County government actually solicited an independent study back in February asking the University of Chicago and some other folks, hey, look at our system and tell us what's going on. And, and UFC said, this is com- messed up. <laughs> politely i mean right. there's another word and so i just use all those in my exhibits like hey your system's messed up and by the right. way you did all my research for me i want my hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> and this whole system thrown out but right now we're on the procedural matters you know getting back to the bigger picture if you can give a court a reason to argue procedure as opposed to the subs of the case if you're the defendant that's what you do and that's what happened in the in the Colorado case, I mean, we didn't even get to the to the fundamental issue of same sex marriage because the other people gave them something else to work with, right? Yeah, and that seems to be this this uh, new moderation on the the next version of the Supreme Court because there's a, been a tremendous amount of turnover. I mean, there's only two old justices, really. I mean, Clarence Thomas is seventy two, so I wouldn't consider it in Supreme Court years old. I mean, uh, at seventy six, Scalia died prematurely, so it was not a conspiracy. Sorry, folks. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, Ginsburg and uh, I think, is it uh, Breyer or Souter? Souter is the one that uh, retired and yeah. Breyer's the Breyer. one that's on, Breyer's on the court. And uh, they're getting up there, but they, they can certainly hold out for even a second term of Donald Trump, I imagine. 
But uh, this for a midterm election, right? So there's a new moderation led by Judge Roberts, where they're going to stop doing these broader, and it is a form of ri- originalism. This is not the purview of the court. This doesn't belong here. This is let's leave this up to the judicial branch, and that's what I heard a lot of people as they examined Kavanaugh today. What they said is that because he was in the district court of D.C., a lot of things are filed around administrative cases about the expansive uh, executive branch. Right. Various, you know, the F, the alphabet soup of things. And so what, what he always stood up for is limiting the power of the executive branch and these regulations and, and the regulatory agencies and their power – saying, no, you can't basically just read into things that aren't in the law. Uh, it's called Chevron deference. Yes, and, I took administrative law. Yeah, and, and, and basically Ex- explain what, Chevron deference because people are hearing a, a lot about this. In a nutshell, without breaking up my administrative law book that's like 500 pages <laughs> long, <laughs> right. Chevron is basically a case as to how much deference should the courts give an administrative agency because Congress does have the power to, you know, to grant administ- to grant these administrative agencies, you know, rule making authority, mm-hmm. because most congressmen don't, don't think the FCC or you know EPA or Security Exchange Commission, they they have no idea what the heck's right. going on. So you so you so you create the agencies and you have people with the expertise to do the rule promulgation with notice and comment and yada 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 blah 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 blah. The the whole thing about Chevron is basically how much deference do you give an administrative agency. For example, Congress can't say, all right, Federal Communications Commission, make rules, whatever. A very good example is Tom Wheeler of the FCC under Obama saying, we have the power to uh, deem the Internet a public utility. Right. And someone like Kavanaugh would say, that's not in your purview. That would have to be the, the Congress making a new law. Or they would say Congress would have to specifically grant you the authority mm-hmm. to do X, Y, Z. Right. And if Congress did not grant you the authority... We're not going to let you do it. Right. So he has always been a proponent of limiting the power of the executive branch, which kudos to him. That's a, that's a point in the in, in our favor uh, in that he is, is uh, right on administrative law. And I have seen from libertarian-leaning critics like Rand Paul and Justin Amash, uh, because he worked in the Bush White House, he's not great on privacy issues. He's not great on um, you know civil liberties. In a lot of ways, so on the Fourth Amendment issues, he's not very strong. But you got to remember too, he's also a Kennedy guy, mm-hmm. and so Kennedy more likely had a lot of influence on him. And, and something else to think about too, as people sort of move up the ladder and you know and get promoted in the judiciary, there's a difference between being a trial judge versus being an appellate judge versus being you know a justice on the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And most people take those positions very seriously because they know their decisions and their opinions have consequences, and so. Expecting you know Kavanaugh to get up there and just run off the rails and go bat crap crazy, I don't think is going to happen. Right. And if you listen, anybody who listened to his speech yesterday, you know the the acceptance, he talked about a respect for precedent. Mm-hmm. That is extremely important. So anybody who I would argue, when he said that, that was the we're not going to come in here and just start. You know, that was the dog whistle. Uh, for 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 conservative Democrats, along with Elena Kagan, hired me. Yeah. To say to Joe Donnelly here in this state, you know, in a Trump red state, a state that went for Trump, saying to Joe Donnelly, the Democrat who's up for re-election in November, you can vote for me. And by the way, it, it, my mom taught in African American schools. Right. You know, you know, we we are big on diversity. I've had a majority of women all my you know professional career. Right. You know, I'm at a school where we, you know, want diversity and excellence because diversity only makes us stronger. But I was reading on Twitter that he was going to reverse Brown Board of Ed- Brown versus the Board of Education. He was going to institute concentration camps. Well, well, remember Abraham Lincoln said, "You can't believe everything you read on the internet." Right. <laughs> so, uh, explain the concept of precedent. So, you know, a lot of libertarians think about the, you know, I read the Constitution, this is what it says, and this is how we're going to execute it. It says we can do these 17 things, and all the rest is delegated to the states. Here's my, here's my but, response. But when, whenever somebody tells me that you don't have certain rights in the Constitution or the Constitution can only do this, I recommend they look up the Ninth Amendment. Can you pull it up real quick on your yeah. computer? It's, um... I fi- I see, I figured you have the Constitution bookmarked. No, no, I've got it on the wall. I just don't have it. 
uh, I don't know the text of it. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Exactly. So, just because it's not in there and it's not said specifically doesn't mean you don't have the right. Just because, And that was sort of the catch-all phrase because you can't include... No, no, let, me, let me clarify that. Mm-hmm. The government doesn't have the right or are you talking about the rights... For, for instance, let's take abortion. Okay, you don't... The, the government doesn't have the right to pass laws making abortion legal or you just because it's not abortion is not covered in the constitution it doesn't mean that you don't have the right to have exactly. An abortion exactly exactly okay. that is how right. i argue ninth amendment jurisprudence okay just because it's not specifically written down does not mean you don't necessarily have the right to do it and please note as an individual as an individual okay. now other thing to think about too is that all rights come with limits i mean i can't well, I could call you something out of, out of your name, mm-hmm. but I can't slander you. Otherwise, I get hauled in the court and you sue. And yeah, I mean, you, there, you, there, it, you it's, can't it's, defraud. You can't right. It's the old steal, yeah. you, you can't put people in danger, which is why I always remind people whenever somebody says, you know, the First Amendment isn't limited. You can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Well, actually, yes, you can if there is a fire. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can't put people, you know, in in, in an immediate danger. You can't intimidate. Right. For instance. Yeah. We, 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 we've always had laws that sort of you know put limits on, on our freedoms because we have to. Otherwise, we have anarchy and chaos, and we're called Somalia. Again, who are you talking to? Yeah, ex- some, exactly. Some of this audience is in, is in in for anarchy, in for chaos. And that's why they're not in charge of anything. <laughs> now, so back to the concept of precedent. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it, there is explain a, precedent to the audience. There is a concept in the court called stare decisis, and basically means prior decisions. And what part of that goes to is when certain things have been done and ruled by the courts, and they've gone through the trial court, the appellate court, and the Supreme Court, we tend to leave those things as they are, mm-hmm. absent some major fundamental change in, in attitudes. And, see, and, and part of this is, and I have my business law notes here because I teach business law uh, for the graduate school at the University of Indianapolis. And one of the things that I remind people or I remind my students is we have to remember what is the job of our courts. What do we want our courts to do? Well, people say, well, the job of the court is just to interpret the law and not make new law. Like, well, yeah, but we also have a court system for conflict resolution. So we're not small here. We're not shooting each other in the streets. It also, and the courts also give us a method to promote social order and change. You know, this is why, you know, hey, you got to pay your child support. Civil court, criminal court. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what stare decisis basically means, unless we've got a really good reason to ignore prior decisions, we tend to stick with them because that gives us a certain amount of predictability. Mm-hmm. People need to know who actually work for a living, you know, and you know, run things, that there's going to be a certain amount of order because what we don't want is chaos, plain right. and simple. And I, I've heard in all of the discussions that I've been I've been listening is isn't that something like a burger fell turning over the decision that gay marriage basically is legal across the United States. People have come to depend on that ruling as a way of life. People are setting their lives up according to a certain law. So you don't change that law because you don't want to disrupt people's lives. Right. Think of the think of the chaos that would erupt if the Supreme Court says no, there is no. The, the, the right to marry does not apply to same-sex couples. Imagine, you know, wills, imagine child support, imagine custody, imagine marital property rights. Just imagine all this stuff turned up mm-hmm. over its year. That that bar, that horse is out of the barn. It's That was, like what, 2015? Yeah. It's 2018. And also, something to keep in mind, too, societal norms have changed. Right. Because it's, you know, it used to be that being homosexual was a crime. Mm-hmm. You know, and you could you know, literally go to jail, you know. Not anymore. Now it's just a crime to look that good. Yeah, and as, that's what I say all the time. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast. I'm Abdul Hakim Shabazz, the guest of host Chris Bangle. For those of you just tuning in, thank you for refreshing. Yeah, see, on a podcast, you don't do as much refreshing. I, I try to do it every once in a while, uh, you know, to keep up the the chops. But... I try to I try to refresh every five minutes. Yeah, because you assume people will kind of tune in and out. Yeah, but commercial radio is so different than podcasting. I mean, you can look down at your phone and see what you're listening to. Well, no, you see, but I still when I when I podcast for any politics, I'll the the average conversation say a conversation goes about fifteen minutes. Sure, about every five, I just sort of refresh. Hey, here's who we're talking to. 
you know, here's what we're talking about. Then I use that to pivot to the next right next topic. Right. Um, Sorry, folks, to bore you with shop talk. There. No, no, I think some people like that. Uh, let's let's take some of the well. Let's get back to Kavanaugh. Okay, let's stick with Kavanaugh. Uh, what is your opinion of him? I mean, what have you read about Kavanaugh? Is this a you know, I hear some people say, oh, he's more like a Rehnquist and a Roberts. He's more uh, moderate conservative, but he's not definitely not Kennedy he is, versus he, he's he's definitely in the camp of Clarence Thomas Gorsuch. He's definitely but he's just a little different. In he, certain he ways. Is, from everything I've read, he is not an activist conservative. I mean, he was when that was his job. Mm -hmm. But as a judge, it's an entirely different creature because you're right. now putting on a new hat. You don't you don't leave who you are at the door, which is why when people say, well, a judge should only look at the law, like, no, you shouldn't. Because right. guess what? When you're listening to arguments and listening and taking testimony, you as a judge, you do not leave your common sense at the door. Because mm -hmm. you got to know, can I curse on here? Just yeah, for sure. Because you got to know when somebody's trying to bullshit you. Right. And if all you're doing is just you know looking at the four corners of the document and that's it, you're going to have some problems. Mm -hmm. we, we pick people because they're wise jurors, because they've got common sense, because they've got experience, they've seen this stuff before right i mean and, and that's the other thing that judges do of course you know should judges make new law i argue people say making new laws just you didn't like the decision <laughs> that's what i define what's judicial activism a decision you didn't like right you know on the one day this is an activist court i can't believe blah blah or this court is the you know the key holders of the constitution <laughs> yeah it just depends on where you come down right on the thing i mean most lawyers you know we, we're professionals we take it as we go but from everything i've read is is he conservative Yes. Is he going to be a flamethrower? I don't think so. Nor will he be a liberal squish. No. Yeah. And I don't think he'll be a bomb thrower or be like Clarence Thomas, who was just so angry over his confirmation, just write bitter opinions over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, so Brett Kavanaugh is probably going to get confirmed. I would say it's probably 99% at this point. Um, how do you think it plays politically? Here's what I think. Because the the one thing that was uh, sort of popped up over 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 the question is, you know, would Donald Trump pick somebody that could get, you know, first of all, instead of talking about Democratic votes, you were you didn't necessarily have all the Republican votes because John McCain is out sick, you know, right. dealing with the brain cancer thing, and you had Lisa Murkowski and also uh, Susan Collins right. saying, hey, you know, we're you know kind of pro-choice women. Roe is precedent, and if we think this guy's going to start acting funny. There you go. And Republicans only have a 51 to 49 majority. Right. Take out John McCain, that's 50. You know, you lose Collins and Murkowski. Now you're sitting in a 48 universe. Or Rand Paul, even. Or, or if, Rand Paul. If he doesn't answer right on the Fourth Amendment stuff, Rand Paul could be out. Yeah. And so you're sitting there at 47. You know, you don't even get to the Democrats yet. And so I, I, I kind of laugh and chuckle when people say, well, Joe Donnelly better do this and Joe Donnelly better do that. Well, you better get your Republicans in line first. <laughs> Because if I'm Joe Donnelly, my response is my vote. I'm just one. He can't. Maybe you talk about getting all your Republicans on board, which is probably why Amy Barrett didn't even really get considered. I mean, she was probably up there to kind of throw that red meat to the base, but she was probably never going to sit in that seat for a confirmation hearing because people are they might not vote for. Her. And Reinhold makes a good point. Rand Paul's going to cave like every other time, but. When it comes to Susan Collin and Murkowski, they may not have have given in on uh, Bar Barnett. All right, and here and here's the funny thing, and we know, we know what really made me like Barnett, even though he's probably a little bit further to the right than I am on things. I'm kind of a Kennedy sort of guy, as you yeah. probably imagine, which just sure. makes people well. Mad. Kennedy, according to Cato, uh, there uh, Ilya Shapiro, Cato is uh, Kennedy was the most libertarian justice in the court's history. Yeah, big on individual rights and individual liberty. Since right. Cato's existed, they always come down with opinions on where do they think things should land according to libertarianism, and Kennedy's voted with them most of the time. And here's the funny thing. I knew I was going to like Kavanaugh when I saw that uh, conservative activist attorney Jim Bob didn't like it. <laughs> Local well, guy who's a very uh, hardcore yeah, yeah. Tea Party. Yeah, kind of religious rights sort of guy. When right. I saw that, because I read a lot of law journals that would just put half the audience to sleep 
when I read the law, the law journal article that Jim Bob was having a problem with, I was like, I like him already. <laughs> if I was a U.S. Senator, he's got my vote. In reality, they're going to be happy with this pick. They'll all fall in line. The, the base will love this pick. The, liber, the liberals were always going to hate this guy. And America, I mean, he seems friendly enough. You watch, if you watched the, the reality TV show uh, reveal last night, uh, beautiful family, seemed like a likable guy. You know, I, it, it's... It's going to be a popular pick at yeah. the end of the day. And, and, and the thing, too, it's also talked about, you know, he talked a little bit about his face and that we're members of the D.C. Catholic community. And guess what? Our opinions are all over the place. Right. So we're not just lockstep with what people think, you know, they're going to get. So he's establishment. And uh, I've, I had this discussion with my brother last night. Uh, he was like, I can't believe he picked an establishment guy. Said, would you hire a plumber with no experience? Yep. <laughs> you know, and it's the argument that you've made to me a lot of times over the years because I go back and forth where, yeah, you want new blood, you want new ideas, you don't want entrenched ideas, but at the same time... I don't want crazy. But, well, it's that can often show us crazy, with our like our friend Melissa. But uh, outside of the mainstream doesn't always necessarily mean crazy. But at the same time, you want some experience. Part of the problem that I think Donald Trump had early on is that none of his team had any experience in Washington, D.C. They had no appreciation for how the power structure works. And, and even at the Libertarian Convention last weekend, there were people— And I'll, and I'll go a step further. The, uh, the other problem with the Trump people is, unlike a, uh, the Reagan universe or you know Clinton or Bush or Obama, the people who came in with the president were all sort of ide ideologically— Right. with him they were loyalists you know the nixon guys what happens when you're loyalist to a fault right and so when the trump people came in it's like hiring a bunch of mercenaries you know everybody is here to get rich how many people have left and turned over since trump became yeah came became president i mean and you got your own lawyer michael cohen about to send you down the river, which is why you should never piss off your lawyer, your girlfriend, or your wife. <laughs> and now he's hiring a bunch of uh, D.C. troglodytes, basically. And it's like last week at the National Libertarian Convention, uh, there was a guy running for chair. It was his first convention, and he was running to be chair of the party, and he didn't win. And the incumbent got reelected by 65%, basically. You can't change a power structure if you don't know who is in the power structure and who you ought to persuade and who you ought to talk to. And and I think that goes along with the way the Washington, D.C. works, and that's part of what I always try to do with this program is, yeah, you may be pissed off that I have a guest on who doesn't think that taxation is theft and he's saying a lot of things that are challenging you, but you need to be challenged because these are the arguments that are made and we as libertarians need to find the answers to kind of go, yeah, but... Uh, and our good friend Mark Rutherford, who's watching right now, uh -huh. I just saw him there. By the way, Mark, always good to see you there. Yes, had the best line. He said, "Learn the rules so you may break them well." Exactly <laughs> right. That's a, brilliantly said, as Mark does. And that's why when you look at somebody who is going on the court, who was the secretary, who read every piece of paper from Bush, who has had twelve years dealing with uh, regulatory experience. And yeah, is he a perfect candidate in the minds of a lot of conservatives and libertarians? No, probably not. But when faced with governing, he has done a, a pretty decent job of trying to limit the size and scope of government. Right. And that's and, all you can ask for when people are actually involved and working for governments. Right. It's their best. <laughs> and, and, and what you want is, I mean, like I said, I look at it, you know, what's the job of government? You know, call the balls and strikes and let, you know, let the players play the game. You just enforce the rules right and what i like my courts to be are you know sort of take that minimalist approach you know what is the least we need to do to enforce xyz rule and if somebody has an issue or problem they don't like something go to the legislature that's why we have elections right uh let's take some of these questions um uh, you're more than welcome to ask questions about the supreme court or the judicial branch i do want to get a clarification because i saw this and it's not on my list What's the difference between appellate courts, district courts, the Supreme Court, state courts? What's kind of the structure? Ah, I'm glad you asked. Let's pull up my notes here. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's like, just like I said, it's like teaching my business law class. In a nutshell, uh, your courts were created by the Constitution, Article 3, Section 1. And here's what it says. So everybody just bear with me for just a moment here. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their positions during good behavior and shall, 
as stated at their times, reserve, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. Okay. So that's where Article 3 is where your judiciary comes in, your, your third branch of government. And the courts are set up, you have a it's sort of similar at the state and the federal level. You have your district courts or your state courts, you have your appellate courts, and you have well, and you have your Supreme Court. Your lower courts are what are called courts of original jurisdiction. That's where matters start. So Spangle v. Shabazz, Spangle files a lawsuit, you know, down at the Marion County building or you know Hancock County, wherever. That's a court of original jurisdiction. Civil, criminal, yeah, all of it. Yeah, but in a nutshell, you know, okay. some are specifically civil, some are specifically criminal. That's where things originate. Your appellate court is, let's say, Spangle v. Shabazz. The judge is an idiot, and you win. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> what I can do is within whatever the time limit is, I can go to the court of appeals. That's a second level and appeal that decision. The appellate court cannot hear new facts. Anything that was going to be in the facts or in the record should have been established at the trial court level. That's that's what we call the trial courts the finder of fact. That's where the facts are established. Appellate gotcha. courts cannot hear cannot hear new facts. Now, if right. there was now, let's say I objected to something during that trial, and it's evidence that should have never gotten in, what the appellate court can do is throw out the lower court's decision and say, all right, this was wrong, this should never happen, we're throwing this out, or they can remand it back. Hey, you guys got the law wrong, here's what the law is, go back and rule in accordance with what the law says. Right. Now, let's say the court is brilliant and the appellate court rules in my favor. Right. You can say, this is totally bogus. I'm going to the Supreme Court, whether it's the U.S. Supreme Court or your state Supreme Court. They are also courts of original jurisdiction because they can hear basically whatever they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And de depending on if it's an original matter, you can't introduce facts like Bush v. Gore because that was just such a novel thing. Which, by the way, Bush v. Gore only applies to Bush v. Gore. Right. It doesn't apply to anything. Do they in put specific language in the decision that that's says? That's specifically in there that okay. says Bush v. Gore only applies to Bush gotcha. v. Gore. Right. Okay. Yeah, and so that's that's how they work. Now, this stuff is expensive, it's complicated, and it takes a really long time because that's kind of the way it's supposed to be. Right. So can something go from a state court? Let's say I get, uh, and I know that we have, I have a Facebook friend who sued the city of Indianapolis over uh, stops. Basically, like, they set up roadblocks, and they were testing for drugs and doing drug sniffing dogs. I could have told your friend to save his money. Road stops are constitutional. No, he on. actually he actually won his case in the Supreme Court, and uh, they couldn't use, like, drug sniffing dogs anymore. I ha I'd have to look it up, what the actual case was. But if you go to... No, probably what it was, you had to have probable cause. Right. You can't just do a, a roadblock, say, on I-65 coming down here. Well, what are you looking for? Well, we're looking for drugs. Well, why? You are can't you looking, do a general search. Right. Are no. you looking for a specific vehicle that matches a specific description or a specific individual? Right. Yes, that you can you can't just willy nilly roadblock sniffer drugs. So he sues in Indianapolis, it goes to the Indiana Supreme Court. Can that then go to the national Supreme Court? You can that can get to actually get to the US Supreme Court depending on the outcome. If he won, don't sell past the close. Okay. Shut up and Yeah, right. Go home and, and call it a day. Uh, if you were going to sue and take it to the U.S. Supreme Court, you had to find some sort of federal constitutional rule violation. You know, was it a Fourth Amendment search and seizure? Was it the Fifth Amendment? You know, due process, self-incrimination. Those will get you that. It's kind of kind of like when you do a national talk show. You want to, you know, uh, one person suggested that I talk to you about something that was happening in Henry County, and I go. What do the other nine thousand counties care about what's happening in Henry County? But right, you got to find the the general interest that applies to all right, of the exactly. United States. What is right. it that happened in Henry County that you know has some sort of universal broad appeal? Right. So Brown versus the Board of Education was a very local thing, but yes, it but, applied to yeah, segregation. But, yeah, but that. Mr. Brown versus his Board of Education, probably not so much. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, so. Let's start with the questions here. Dakota Davis asks, how did the SCOTUS gain so much power and how can it be reeled in? That, I don't understand the question. All right, so let me, let me uh, probably Marbury versus Madison is where this begins. Uh, it, it seems to many people that the Supreme Court wields a tremendous amount of power, that you have these justices who are, are sitting there in their black robes with their lifetime appointments making sweeping 
legal decisions that change the law for states, for instance. You know, well, but because it's in there because. What is, the, what is the job of the Supreme Court? It's to decide what is constitutional and what mm -hmm. isn't. That's the only power they have. Right. I mean, it's that simple. And if the court finds that something is unconstitutional, then that's that's kind of it. Now, you can probably come back later if you can find a different case of different facts that you know maybe that a constitutional thing is thrown out. But the we always jokingly call it Marbury versus Madison the because we said so mm -hmm. case because, you know, well, like I just said, you know, shall be invested in a Supreme Court. And what's the job of the Supreme Court? determine what's constitutional right that's their job right okay i'm trying not to be flippant but uh, i know it's, it's, that's that's kind of con law 101 that's, well, that's what we're doing here yeah we're doing and, con and, law. and the funny thing is we spent like in law school we spent like three weeks on that case really yeah on marbury versus madison, madison. yeah because it's such a huge explain what that is um i can't i can't remember the facts it was like a postal appointment i think it was and some guy wanted his post office appointment. It was like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, of like 1803, 05. I don't remember the exact facts. I just remember that at the end of the day, it was a because we said so mm -hmm. case. Yeah. And what was the fallout from Marbury versus Madison? What what precedent did it actually set? The Supreme Court is the final sayer of what's constitutional. Okay. So, but you can go back and change things in the. Uh, so, I guess part of the issue is like Roe v. Wade, for instance. Mm -hmm makes abortion legal in all 50 states well not all 50 states want abortion to be legal within their boundaries that is an example i think for a lot of people where you do have that judicial activism well it was seven to two so i don't know how much judicial activism is is there sure i mean i can see if you're like you're talking like a five to four yeah but when once you get like that six to three seven to two category you're you're not really talking activism anymore per se I by mean, the I, way all decided by white men yeah <laughs> none guess, of those seven were women because guess what it's 1974 <laughs> i think it is what well, this is my own question for you why has it, it seems like you watch cnn and it's the only thing that matters so conservatives their litmus test is constitutional you know literal literalism basically read the constitution and be uh originalist and what was the uh the founder's intent like that's the litmus test for conservatives but with liberals it's roe v wade the media and the left all they seem to care about is what a justice thinks about roe v wade has it always been like that or is it just like really intense with this guy only like in the past 20 years has it kind of gotten to that point it's almost become um ben shapiro jokingly called it a sacrament yeah and, and in a lot of ways he's right it's become this where it's not safe rare and legal because we're kind of ashamed that this exists in our society to now it's aggressively celebrated and you aren't a real woman if you're not having an abortion and like it's it's you see, but I disagree. Gone the other way i disagree because there's another school of thought that says no abortion ever like a certain person who's a congressman from mm -hmm. the fourth congressional district who lost his own you know, county and you know, only 60% of the people in his own home precinct voted against him. Right. You know, it was one of those no abortion ever. Like, uh, dude, woman may die if she gives birth complications. I don't think so. Sure. The, the, and see, and actually the, the real law on abortion isn't really Roe versus Wade. It's, it's a case called Casey versus Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. out of Pennsylvania. That is actually the more accurate law on abortion in America today now of course new justices explain that please uh, and, and in a nutshell what it says is the government can regulate abortion but you can't outright ban it kind of like alcohol mm -hmm. you can regulate you know alcohol but you can't do an outright ban gotcha you just can't do it now the question is when the government regulates you know abortion are they doing it in such a way that is you know a normal health and safety procedure or are you infringing on the on the basic principle that a woman has a right to determine, you know, up to a certain point, whether she wants to keep or carry her term to pregnancy for one reason or another? the The problem is is and, I, and I, this is going to sound really weird. So many people make so much money getting people worked up over all this. Yeah, that's why I argue. See, so you hear half the yelling and screaming all the time. There, there isn't. I can't. Um, I, is there like an impending Supreme Court case that CNN knows about that I don't? That abortion is about to be banned because if you watched CNN last night, it was all over the. Uh, you know, every abortion group was on there saying it's all over. Like it's it, it, no matter what side you're on, pro-choice, pro-life, like the manipulation and the hysteria around this single issue 
uh, and this pick seems so over the top and ridiculous to me that I just don't I don't get where this is coming from because what's what some people are it's what what some people who are extremely pro choice and full disclosure I'm you know, pro choice with limitations I mean I don't think you should be able to get abortion to drive through but right you know, I do believe if my wife and I found ourselves in that situation that is our decision to make and nobody else's mm-hmm. end of end of discussion you know that's between me and her but then I always love the well, what if your wife wanted to get abortion and you didn't want her to have it? Bob, you wouldn't have any say. Like, you know what? If our relationship is at that point, we got other issues to, right. to worry about. If, if that's what it's come down to. And so some people are concerned that if Roe v. Wade were overturned, it would just you know send it back to the states. That's really all would happen. Mm-hmm. And then states would decide whether to keep it or get rid of it. Once again, we're coming up on you know, almost you know, soon 50 years you know, of a woman having a right to choose and what you will find is courts are very very hesitant to take rights away once they've been granted they may not necessarily grant new rights but once those rights have been granted people had them for a while kind of what we were talking about with gay marriage yeah it's they're they're very hesitant to, to take that away and if you're republican conservatives and your whole mission in this world has been to get rid of abortion you do you will never ever hold office ever again because women will come out of the woodworks. <laughs> because you know who lives, you know who tends to get them? Suburban Republican women. Yeah. No, it's very true. Yeah. So th- I guess I just look at this and I go, this isn't like I, I, part of what drives me crazy is that people don't do the reading. Like if you all you've got to do every day is go to Vox, go to National Review, go to Reason, and go to the New York Times. Just read those four things. And you probably have a pretty good picture of what's going on in the United States. You've got the left, the right, the libertarian, and and the straight mainstream. If you do those things, you're not so freaked out because you realize what's going to happen is if if abortion uh, case came before the Supreme Court, Roberts and now Kavanaugh are going to limit the power of it to the point that it'll apply just to this case, just like the masterpiece case. You know that that was a punt where basically they were saying. We don't really need to set a law here or make any if, kind of precedent because society's these, taking care of it if itself. These, if these folks can, if the court can find the most narrow of grounds to do something, usually justices will. Right, especially in a bigger case like yeah. that. So the the hysteria over it is just so over the top. Like I saw Terry McCall Terry McAuliffe tweeting out before we sat down saying millions of people are going to die due to the Supreme Court pick that Trump made. Millions of people are going to die. He gave no explanation as to how. And you just go, well, they were going to die with tax cuts. They were going to die with Gorsuch. They were, now they're going to die with Kavanaugh. They're going to die with ACA. Like, at what point are we going to stop all of the uh, the killing that I isn't would, happening? I, I would think everybody would have been dead by now. I know. <laughs> it's just it's There's nobody left. Just just me and you talking to each other. That's yeah. why I thought Barrett would have been a good pick because it would have sent them. They're just the left doesn't realize that they are are like really taking things so far that they're losing the center of the country. Yeah. And you've the, got the, Donald fucking Trump as your president. Like, the, it's a layup. The, the hyperbole is, in my opinion, ridiculous, which is why I really don't watch a lot of uh, talking head shows anymore, whether Fox, CNN, or MSNBC. The only time, actually, the only time I really watch them is for election right. results. Yeah. All right, so next question. Um, so we talked about the federal appears, appeals courts. Uh Hody Johns asks, something I've always wondered was how the founders envisioned the SCOTUS uh, as it was supposed to be at the third branch. How do they keep the, how, how uh, this is, I think I didn't write this right. Um, basically, he wants to know, how can they maintain um, their uh, integrity when they're appointed by the other two branches? Easy. It's called a lifetime appointment. Okay. Explain, please. I got the job for life. F- I got F U money. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Mr. Obvious. <laughs> right. If I may use a Bob and Tom reference. Yes, please. You know what uh, I got, Bill? I got fuck you money, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I, got money to say, fuck you. <laughs> I mean, no, but, but that is why I like the lifetime appointment thing. I mean, because guess what? It fr- now frees your justices you know, from any undue political influence. I got into a big debate with some of my friends here in Marion County over whether judges should be appointed or elected. I do not believe in elected judges. I agree. I have 100%. never been a big fan, and I'm not a fan of elected judges because most people have no idea what the hell they're voting for. There are thousands of people in this audience, 
and I bet you Phyllis Klosinski is the only one who knows what judges she's voting for, and you. Yep. <laughs> like, and that's it. And in Mary County, you don't vote for judges anymore, then I'll appoint it. Right. And I was a big advocate of that. Yeah. You know, put together your judicial panel of, of, of people or whatever, and make sure that whoever gets picked, you can't just be the 50 plus one, it's got to be 60, so there's a... You know, your Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, non-politically affiliated people, you know, can do the judges on the merit. Now, will you get rid of politics? No, because everybody will be lobbying. Right. That happened with Kavanaugh. I mean, uh, his friends from the Bush days were all lobbying to get Kavanaugh in both the media and privately uh, picked. I mean, that's it was very aggressive. Uh, so that happens now. Yeah. So this. So yeah. So that. So that'll happen. But you know, but when you have a when you have an independent judiciary. Now, granted, yeah. People talk. People know each other because we all know each other. It's going to sure. be 100% independent. No, because somebody's going to be on the golf course one day. You know, like, hey, John, you know, I got that thing. I'm like, yeah, I know you got that thing. And then just sort of leave it yeah. at that. But also, it's reputations. Mm-hmm. You know? I was in court today in Marion County. The judges knew me. How did the judges know me? Guess what? Reputation. <laughs> Reputation. You know, from the radio, television, and everything else. Like, oh, Abdul? Like, oh, hey, nice to see you. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> you know, good to be here. Now, the, the judge rule in any way that was unfair no because our case was pretty much said done also helps when the defendants don't show up so you can get a default judgment yeah but yeah stuff like that happens all the time like why do you why do you pick a lawyer that's familiar with a certain court because the court they know the judge they they know that they know the system they know the process and that's actually what you want that's if you've listened to amanda's story on uh, the cost episode that i posted about a month ago that's why he ended up getting, uh, I'll spoil the surprise, he ended up getting full custody of the daughter, and it's because he hired a lawyer who was best friends with the family court judge. Yep. And now, does, now, does that mean that the the attorney got extra special treatment? I would say more likely not, but what I will say- Oh, no, they did. Well, well, yeah, but <laughs> In what, this case, yes. Yeah, but what I will say is, you know, the, the old joke is, you know, a good lawyer knows the law, a great lawyer knows the judge. Because, you know, you have established reputations, people right. know who you are, and the judge knows you're not going to bring, you know- any BS. You know, right. I started doing some stuff over Hancock County. I've run to the same commissioner the last two, three times. So now I'm a familiar, you know, familiar face. So, right. hi, Mr. Shabazz, good to see you again. Like, you know, thank you, Mr. Coons. Always, always going to be back in, you know, sunny, hand, sunny, sunny Greenfield. Now, why do you think that the public perception of networking in that way amongst government officials is seen as such a bad thing? Because they're not getting in on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If they were there, they'd be doing the exact same thing. That's sort of what I've always maintained. Uh, you know, now that I know better and I'm a little wiser to the system, and uh, you know, you know how many uh, Abdul has helped me out with some stuff. And you know right. what? It's because Abdul knows some people. Right. And hey, this is pretty great. I've got a friend who can help me out with stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that simple. I mean, we do it all the time in all our professional lives and personal lives. Hey, I got a problem. Don't worry, my dad knows somebody who might be able to help you. Uh, some friends of mine, their son got a DUI, and they live in Hendricks County, got a DUI in Marion County, got locked up. They're freaking out, going bat crap, crazy. They called me, Abdul, is there anything we can do? Like, tell you what, here's a number, here's a friend of mine, she's one of the best criminal defense attorneys in town. You know, She can kind of expedite this process for you. Within 24 hours, she had the kid, you know, bail and bond posted and out. Now, some people say, well, that's not fair. What about other people who don't know anybody? Well, that sounds like a personal problem to me. It's honestly so easy to be establishment. <laughs> you just keep showing up. <laughs> and, and and it doesn't matter what political party you're in. You know, I mean, for, for my own self, I just kept showing up. And now I, I know a lot of people in the Libertarian Party. And it wasn't because I was special. It's just because I was dedicated and I kept showing up. And it's work. Right. Right. I mean, showing showing up is work, and you have to do more than just sit on your behind your computer in your mom's basement and just you know, blah blah blah, blather blather blather, and just throw stuff online. Because hey hey gonna, hey, that I resemble that remark. Yeah, but no, but 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 the very least, my friend, you know, you made yourself known in libertarian circles. Right. You, know, you used to be the executive director of the you know Libertarian Party of Indiana. You know, you went out and actually did you know a lot of the legwork and everything. Mm-hmm. And so, what what I tell people is who. They, it's, it's, ah, here's a perfect analogy. Just because somebody watches football on television, it doesn't mean you can coach the NFL. It's exactly right. F- politics and f- football especially, but sports, are the two where people with no talent, who have had no effort, 
think that they know how to coach a team. Yeah. Like, you don't know how to coach a team better than Bill Belichick. Right. You don't know how to select a team better than Chris Ballard. I mean, you just right. don't. Just because you play fantasy football. <laughs> right. Because what you realize is that there are constraints on the other side of that news story that you don't often see. And this is what drives me crazy about reading comment sections is that people don't often just kind of give the benefit of the doubt or put themselves in the shoes of other people and think, yeah, this this doesn't make sense. But it's because there are certain budgetary constraints, personnel constraints, there are X, Y, and Z constraints that you don't even that you're not even aware of that cause that outcome that looks bad. And that's often why I don't advocate for government is because over the last fifteen years of, you know, being around local politics, national politics, you see that it doesn't work effectively because there are so many different constraints because public is different than private organizations. Yep. And so, and those constraints are there for a reason because right. it's the public's money. Right. Exactly right. But every citizen has the ability to get engaged, and the way that you get engaged is not by showing up and hurling insults and being an asshole. It's like showing up and say, "Hey, I want to know what's going on. Can you explain this to me?" Right. You know, start with some humility as opposed to just like hurling and or not even humility, just be polite. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it is so, and maybe you can elaborate on this, but it's so easy to show up to a local city council, council meeting or a city government meeting or a state house uh, session and meet all of the legislators, your legislator, the governor. It's really easy to do. Indiana lawmakers, they do this thing called the third house, which is a couple times a year, they have like town hall meetings in their district, right? You know, at the local YMCA or a church or whatever, sort of public, you know, high school, public building. You go to that, your lawmakers are right there yep. for you to see, touch, talk, ask questions, what's going on. What you realize over a period of time is that bureaucrats and politicians generally do have the best interest of the public at heart. They're just constrained by X, Y, and Z. Right, and most people who are in, who are in public life just want to go to work, do their job, because guess what? Some people actually do believe in public service. Right. Because they believe, hey, you know what? I could, yeah, I could probably go make a bajillion dollars, but you know what? I enjoy helping people solve their problems. Right. All right. So John Chang wants to know, uh, actually, Danny asks, Danny Lundy, uh, he's seen the idea being floated of expanding the number of justices after the 2020 elections. What is the process to do that? How hard would it be to accomplish? And what are the odds we'll see an attempt? Um, it's already actually been tried before. Mm -hmm. uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to do that in the 1930s when he was trying to implement the New Deal. And yep. the court just kept shooting things down after... <laughs> after New Deal program, after New Deal program. And if my memory serves me correct for my history, he tried to get Congress to change the law so he could get more justice on the Supreme Court and Congress shot it down. I think it was like 15, yeah. and he was going to pack it's the pack, court packing scandal, and it ended up not working. They wanted to... Uh, is, it a, is it a law in Congress, or is it a constitutional amendment? I think it's a law in Congress. Okay. Um, John asks, John Chang, how does the SCOTUS choose what cases they want to hear, and why does it seem that they're ducking the Second Amendment? How are they ducking the Second Amendment? I don't understand. They, I mean, this is the same court that came back with what's called the Heller decision, if I got the name correctly, that said the Second Amendment is an individual right and not a militia right. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know what they're talking about. All right, let's, let's go with the broader question of how do they choose their cases. Uh, usually what happens is, well, first of all, you you know, got to win or lose at the lower court level. Right. And then you got to do something at the appellate court level. And then if you decide to appeal to the Supreme Court, I want to say what it takes is, it's called a, a writ of sorority. And if I'm getting my Latin phrase correctly, which means, you know, the justice kind of look at, uh, here's what's in front of us. You know, let's figure out what we, you know, what we want to take. I mean, it's like anything else. They decide, hey, you know what? There is a, there is an interesting novel legal question here. You know, that must be resolved. No, no, there's really nothing new here. This person just didn't like the outcome. Boom, we'll just kick right. it back. Yeah, if you go look on SCOTUS blog, which is a great site to kind of monitor what's going on in the Supreme Court, you can see what writs are before the court, what was rejected. They give an opinion as to why it was rejected most of the time. Yeah, because so, most of the stuff never sees the light of day. Absolutely. And, and most Supreme Court decisions are usually in the, you know, six plus category. They really only hear about six cases a year. Well, they hear more than that. I mean, but also you got to remember too. There's a difference between hearing a case and an oral arguments versus written art, written briefs. Yeah. And what happens is when you submit something to a Supreme Court, you have to submit your written briefs. You know, here's my argument as to why we think we should win, or why the other side got it wrong. 
And if the courts have more questions, they will ask for oral arguments. That's right. what they want to hear from. That's what they want to hear from both parties. They think they know what's going on, but hey, I want to hear you advocate for X, Y, Z. Uh, from Twitter, Dork in the Mitten <laughs> asks, "I'd love to hear a deep dive on the impact of Congress's abdication of legislative responsibility and how that concentration of power in the executive has impacted the court's influence in recent history." I would argue the the with Congress being so polarized, particularly over the last ten years, and not getting anything done. I don't excuse it with the last president or this one. But I understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're frustrated and can't get anything done, okay, we're going to see whatever we can do within our executive power to accomplish X, Y, Z. Right. And if the executive oversteps his or her authority, somebody files a lawsuit, ends up going through the court system, and that authority is thrown out or granted. That's one of the unintended consequences of getting rid of pork. And so it's one of those things that seems like a good idea at the time, but it gives you something, an outcome far worse where – you have the home districts getting projects. That's how Ron Paul basically stayed uh, reelected year after year after year, even though he only talked about gold, uh, because he brought so much pork back to his home district. And they, they, they were able to wheel and deal and, hey, I'll do this if you do this, uh, trade votes much easier. And that's why Congress had more power than it does now. And so by giving up pork and killing off that system, you end up with the executive, you end up with intraction, and then you end up with the executive branch starting to grow. And, 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 uh, and by the, the way, for everybody who thinks this whole wheeling and dealing is a bad idea, how do you think you got your constitution? <laughs> right. Well, it's just the nature of government. You, you, you might want to go watch 1776. Right. The more power your government has, the more wheeling and dealing there will be with greater consequences. And it's just the reality of it. You see, but I think the wheeling and dealing is a good thing. Mm hmm. Because guess what? You know, the right honorable gentleman from, say, Indianapolis, which would be me, right. you know, has some of the right honorable gentleman from Plainfield, mm -hmm. you know, hey, Abdul, I need your help on X, Y, Z. We're trying to build this road on, you know, we're trying to expand, you know, 267 to four lanes. Okay, right. Chris, tell you what, I understand what you guys are trying to do. You made a good case. Tell you what, here's what I need from you. I need more money for my schools for special ed teachers because we got a lot of special needs kids. Right. Tell you what. I help you out with your roads. You help me out with my schools. It's called log rolling. You know, it's, it's, yeah. And what ended up happening is putting that power and that money back into the hands of unelected bureaucrats. And then so that's why you see the district court uh, and, you know, Kavanaugh and his history is basically tamping down on the growth of the administrative state. Yeah. Because it has grown under Barack Obama and, and George Bush and now uh, Donald Trump. Yeah. And the. But I, I will give Donald Trump credit. They have like scaled back a lot of rules and the, oh, yeah. the regulatory scheme. We could argue whether that's good or bad, but but they have done a lot of that. Uh, final question. I saw it roll in from our friend Ryan Bennett. He wants to, and this is not Supreme Court related, but he asks, uh, and I know how we're, we're going to come down on this. He asks what we think about the Electoral College versus the popular vote. Uh, would you like to see the Electoral College abolished? Nope. Yeah, me neither. If you're going to get rid of Electoral College, you may as well get rid of the United States Senate. Uh, and I believe that we should switch the Senate back to the states selecting the senators nope. and not uh -uh. the popular vote. Nope. Uh -uh. No, I disagree. No, uh, no, no, nope. no, 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 uh -uh. no. Nope. Why? No, 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 because I deal with legislatures every day. Yeah. I, have <laughs> you I, dealt with voters? Yeah. <laughs> I'd much rather have voters than a legislature. I, I wouldn't. I, I, I and, 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 that, that completely and, and, undermines your argument. Your yeah. argument is that legislators are more plugged into the process and are going to make a better decision than voters. But part of your problem... Go back into your 17th Amendment history. I wonder why they got rid of this. Well, here's a big sack of money. <laughs> right. Make me a senator. Okay. Okay, gee, I wonder where Bob Grant's at tonight. Oh, in a restaurant in Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's right, getting 30 grand a pop. 30 grand <laughs> uh, for access to the president. Vice president. Vice president, <laughs> yeah. Like, that doesn't happen now. I mean, I'm sure that... Uh, that Todd Young was just magically, uh, a wand was waved by Bob Grand, the local law firm leader, to, to put him on the ballot. Like, it, it, it isn't any different. I mean, so... Pick your poison. It, it's exactly right. It's like the pork thing. You're you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. That's why you don't ever do government, kids. You've well, got to stay off it. I love government. I do know government. you do. Do lots of government. Yeah, because... Why should, why should make this line disappear? Take this $100 bill. Oh, I've got one in my pocket. <laughs> Uh, oh look, there's five. One money at the Antelope Club today. Holy, <laughs> holy hell! Would you like to make a donation to We Are Libertarians? I actually got to make a donation to the loving Mrs. Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> that's, much... that's where my money goes. Yeah, I know. I got a hot wife. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, I, I am, uh, and I know Abdul 
has has I was I started off such a good little Democrat, small D, believing in the power of the people. And well, then see, I met see, the, and then I met the people, and then I was like, you know what? We need to have as much republicanism as I can possibly stand. You see, but I don't necessarily think people are stupid. Some people are. I think people are busy. Mm-hmm. They have lives. They have kids. They're trying to get through school. They're trying to pay mortgages. Yeah. And what elected officials have done is they've made government irrelevant to most people because they're arguing so much, so much time arguing over stupid stuff right. that doesn't really impact a majority of like the population. Like Roe versus Wade. Yeah, so people yeah. just tune it out. Well, it's just a bunch of politicians doing right. whatever it is they're doing. And when you don't show up and vote and hold people accountable, then here we go. Yeah. Uh, so I think the Electoral College should not be abolished because I believe in a Republican uh, a Republican system. I, just, I think representation is the name of the game. I think more, the closer we get to pure democracy, the messier things have, have gotten. You see, and, and also for the for people who think that you know, we should go for the popular vote instead of the Electoral College, then you just basically give the presidency to 10 states. Yeah. And I, I would I would say that the reason that I believe that is the system was set up to protect liberties. It was to protect – it was to make the whole system very slow. And Actually, no. It was set up so the small states would not be dominated by Virginia and New York. I'm talking York. about the entire <laughs> – the entire Constitution was set up so that – you couldn't move at a fast pace. That's why the Senate exists. It's the the cooler to the passions of the House. Well, it also exists because we're adapting the ways of our former British overlords. Our, yeah, our House of Lords and our House of Commons. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so Speaker Casey calls the Senate the House of Lords, um, in a derogatory way. It's you mentioned 1776. Very popular in the comments. Watch it every Fourth of July. I didn't. I need to get my copy out of the storage unit. I, I missed it this year, but great movie. It was on Turner Classic Movies. Ah. Uh, Sit down, John. Yeah. <laughs> Good God. Thank God you have John Adams to abuse because no sane man would take it. <laughs> uh, I want to finish up real quick. I'm disliked and I'm obnoxious and disliked. Haven't you heard? Right. <laughs> did, did you know that? I hadn't heard. I want to finish up with uh, Curtis. So you, so you mean I can't break into a rendition of molasses to rum? Go for it. I'm, I'm here for it. No, I'm not doing molasses to rum to slaves <laughs> and get my ass kicked. So I want to finish up with Curtis Hill. Now, this is a local story, but I think it, it has broader questions. I want to hear what— It's made national headlines, by the way. Yeah, so the Indian Attorney General groped uh, four butts, allegedly. Allegedly groped four butts of uh, young females. And actually, what, What's one. the details of the story? The, the detail of the story is, uh, on the last night of session, which is called Sunday Die, okay. uh, there was an end-of-session party. They happened at the end of— Every session, my spider sense said there may not be one next year. <laughs> uh, it was at a place called AJ's, uh, south of downtown, just past the 65-70 uh, split. Uh, the attorney general was there. He was accused of behaving inappropriately, uh, you know, grabbing a lawmaker's rear end and you know, sexually in- inappropriately touching three staffers. Uh, the staffers went to the legislature. The legislature commissioned a sort of a – they came up with a policy. They had a law firm, uh, TAF. They got some good employ- employment lawyers review the allegations and just sort of said, hey, you know, you guys are employers. You're not on the hook for sexual harassment, but you might want to talk to, you know, the attorney general. The report gets leaked. I think I know who did it. The report gets leaked. You know, then everybody's freaking out. People saying the lawmakers tried to hide this information. No, they didn't. They're acting as employers and human resource. Anybody who's ever had a job right. knows that the HR people, you don't talk about personnel stuff. You just right. don't do it until, and they were still trying to figure out exactly, you know, how do we address this? It gets out. Everybody's screaming, hashtag me too. And the calls for the attorney general to resign. He says, I'm not resigning, not stepping down. Where's my due process? We're not talking due process in the traditional sense of criminal and civil law, but it's like, you know, no one spoke to me. Nobody interviewed me. You know, nobody talked to me. I didn't get any sort of, you know, hearing or chance to tell my side. Because they they hadn't even gotten to it yet, right? I mean, it leaked before it could even get to that point. Well, that's one that's one interpretation of what happened. Okay. And then people start saying, well, you need to resign, you know, step down. Then they're going to turn over to the inspector general. And there was some question where the IG actually had the authority, you know, to, to prosecute the attorney general. And a lot of folks have gone back and forth. But in a nutshell... It's kind of a mess right right now. Yeah, and and you see the comments online because he basically came out and did a press conference and he's just stoked. Here's the thing. Here's my thing about Curtis Hill. I'm sure you're going to disagree with me, 
but he Oh, is, that's what black conservative lawyers do. We all right. stick together. He panders and he's a social conservative and he just kind of like I, I heard one story where he was talking to one friend of mine who where he was like you know, uh, Donald Trump's the worst. Somebody needs to do something about that guy. And then the next month he's introducing him on stage. Like he's an opportunist who is trying to get ahead in his career. He wants to run for governor. And uh, so, you know, he's uh, some, how does the governor fit in? Because he's, he's blaming the governor for the leak of the report, or is he trying to challenge governor Holcomb at some point and they, they're feuding? Like what's the, I've seen that kind of talked about online, but I don't I don't know how that plays in. I mean, the, the governor and attorney general did not get up necessarily to the best relationship. It, it reportedly, up until this point, it had gotten a lot better. Uh -huh. I think probably things have, have gone south. What, what I will argue is, and like I said, I've spoken to the attorney general. He says he's adamant he didn't do it. The, the women said he did. I found as an attorney, sometimes the truth may be somewhere in the middle. Sure. Now that somebody bumped into somebody or like, hey, Chris, how you doing? And somebody felt uncomfortable. I, I can see that. But, four. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, once you get to four, that's kind of the, the, the pattern. I but mean, but but one of them actually didn't touch anything. He just said something. Because they, they're at the okay. bar. They're at a bar at AJ's, which is kind of crowded. And the women are trying to get waited on. Mm -hmm. And the bartenders ignore them. So he just kind of said, hey, maybe if you showed some more leg or something, uh -huh. you might get served faster. Yeah. Are these Republicans, Democrats, the the accusers? Um, two of the, the two of the accusers that have come forward are both Democrats. Okay. I don't know about the political affiliation uh, of the other two. And to to the women's credit, they actually didn't want this to go public. They just sure. wanted it taken care of because guess what? They spoke to the speaker, sent the president, the legislative guys in confidence. Yeah. And so, like, hey, tell us this will not go. This will not leave. You know, this room. Next thing you know, a report gets leaked. It's all over the Annapolis Star, and now they got to deal with all this. And to me, it has a chilling effect because now. If a woman is sexually harassed or in one of these compromised situations, how do I go tell my story knowing that it's got a chance of being all over all over the friggin' newspaper? Yeah, that's the that's the I mean, that's just the tension between the press and, and the government, uh, because, you know, in a situation like this, does the public have a right to know that their attorney general is accused of sexual harassment? Probably. But I, I do think but, that but there I, should be ways to handle that so it's an appropriate release of information. What, what, what I would have argued is what should have been done is once the uh, legislative report was done, okay, let's take our findings. Here's what our investigation found. Let's call, First of all, let's call the attorney general in, even though we, he's not an employee, so we have no legal authority to do sure. so. But let's go somewhere off the grid. Hey, Curtis, at the Sunday night party, here's what some lady, four ladies have said. What's your side of the story? Get his side of the story first, and then if there's something you think is there, turn that over to the inspector. Because right now, it's just a human resources internal employee right. issue. And, and there's, it, no, there's no quote-unquote trial or anything. Right. And that's the thing that I see online from people, because they don't, under, they don't want to deal with the complexity of it. They just want to argue for their guy. And if this were a Curtis Hill Democrat, the same people would not be arguing for due process for Curtis Hill. Right. And They'd just be screaming. And so, and this is a problem I have with African-American lawmakers who come out and mm -hmm. say that Curtis Hill should resign and step down. I was like, whoa, you bastards spend all day complaining about how black men cannot get justice in the judicial system, <laughs> how unfair it is, and they don't get you know, their day in court, and they're always railroaded. And so what happens? You do the exact same thing. You're the pigs in Animal Farm. Uh, someone asked, who does Abdul think leaked it? If you think I'm going to be able to get that out of him, you're crazy. Yeah, then that, no. A Abdul, <laughs> Abdul knows. The reason Abdul people tell Abdul everything is because Abdul doesn't leak it to the Indianapolis Star. Nope. Um, yeah, the the issue for me is part of his... his he, now, he's turning it around. He's doing a Roy Moore. His statement yesterday was basically, uh, I'm just being unfairly accused, and he's... He's whipping up the baby boomer Republicans and, and turning them against the uh, political establishment. And he's not taking any kind of responsibility or it, he's, he's just kind of taking a hostile stance, which is a great move because that's how you get out of it. I mean, that's how Donald Trump and Roy Moore got out of it in a, in a lot of ways. But this process of dealing with elected officials who are currently serving seems completely broken. Just hurling accusations at a guy. I mean, do, do I think that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle? Absolutely. And the public does have a right to know at this point because he is serving see, but, us. But, see, but I would argue the, the public has a right to know once a thorough investigation has been done. I, I would agree with that. Because, yeah. because if I was the attorney general, since 
you know, this has the potential for criminal charges, the first thing you do, and the man was prosecuted for darn near 30 years, you shut up. Right. And stop talking because anything you say can and probably will be used against you in a court of law. That's sure. why at the end of his news conference the other day, he said, I'm not going to answer any questions because of, you know, the potential, you know, for criminal liability. He just basically kept it to the very broad, you know, sort of broad themes. I'm innocent. Nobody talked to me. Nobody interviewed me. You know, where do I go to get my name back? Now I'm going, now I'm going back to work. The, what I will argue, the, I'm trying to figure out exactly how to say this. The, the problem is that this should have been handled totally, completely differently. But once the report ends up getting leaked, we're now in a whole complete different universe. And for people who are good friends of mine, governor, speaker, senate president, for a lot of folks to say, hey, you need to step down and resign. And then you say, well, we're now we're going to turn over to the inspector general. Like, well, maybe we should have done to send it to the inspector general first sure. and then to. Yeah, because he has a right to be treated fairly and, and have the process work the way that the process should work, I mean, even if there is no process, you know, in a in a private setting, because if he didn't do it, even he should, Jeffrey even Jeffrey Dahmer got a trial. He, exactly right. <laughs> he ate people. But at the same time, I see women. I see people saying this happened four months ago. Why are women just now coming forward? The timing seems seems suspicious. It's like I don't think those people, those boneheads, don't really seem to understand that. People who feel like they've been violated don't jump up on their feet and say, oh, I just won bingo. You know, like it, it takes time for them to be comfortable to tell their story, to come out. They don't want to be engrossed in headlines around a public figure. Like, I, I don't get this mentality of conservative boomers especially saying uh, the second someone is harassed, they should just immediately leak it to the press. Like, that's kind of what they're saying. Like, they should have a fair trial. Why are they hiding this? And, see, and, and, and the, part of, and part of the, the challenge for the attorney general, too, is this is a little bit of a personality thing. You know, they came in kind of like gangbusters, uh, like, you know, on organization day. They came out like, you know, against the needle exchange and some other things. Right. And they did not necessarily endear themselves to the law. Once again, getting back, right. kind of circling back full circle, you know, to the statehouse process, statehouse culture. Yeah. And you, and you do that because... And because my advice, had I gone to work for the attorney general, is, okay, here's what you're going to do for your first year. You're going to, you know, we're going to basically do the work of the attorney general's office, you know, protect consumers, defend legislation, et cetera, et cetera. All that other stuff, like getting in the middle of some of these national issues. Banning CBD across the state. Yeah. We're, we're getting off that radar. Now, if we have issues with CBD oil, then we will privately express our concerns, but we're not going to do it in such a way it looks like we're picking a fight with the legislature. Because guess what? It's 150 of them. And one of you. Yeah. And so let's, so, let's ask Todd Rakita how that right, strategy right, worked out. Right. What we're going to do for our for our first year, who still hasn't found a job, by the way, I wonder why, uh, for the first year is you're going to do the Lincoln Day Circuit. You know, if somebody wants you to speak, you're going to go speak and help these guys raise money. You're going to, they're going to love you so much because guess what? You're African American, you are Republican, and you're the highest vote getter in the state of Indiana. You yep. got more votes than Donald Trump. The, the, we got one. Yep. That's sort of the attitude. A black black Republican is like, ooh, like gold. Yeah, and then to spoil that goodwill and to be, you know, and then, he, I, then I'm taking that and build all that goodwill because the day will always come when something is going to happen, and that day is here. Now, yep. people ask me, do you think Curtis Hill can survive? I say, yeah, I think he can. But it's a very it's a it's a complicated path to to survival. But then again, also we live in an age of Donald Trump, so anything is possible. And manipulating the public to kind of come to his defense and be just ridiculous you see, isn't going to help him. You see, but I don't think it, I don't think it's manipulating the public because at the end of the day, if somebody's accused of something, people want the accused, you know, to have a fair and impartial hearing. Right. They want it to be fair. Now, if you did it, you, of course you're going to be held accountable, but. If we're already calling for the guy to resign and nothing's gotten to the inspector general, people like, well, and nobody spoke to him, like, well, how fair is that? Once again, we don't get to the allegations because guess what? We got the procedure to deal with. Exactly right. P Amazing how the show all day to day. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, and and you're right. The, the sad part is that the chilling effect is that women who, uh, like, I have, I, I met somebody recently who worked at a local bar that a lot of, you know, these guys go to. And she just said the sexual harassment is unreal, and you know everybody turns a blind eye, a blind eye to it. No, I believe it's very real. It's very real, and it shouldn't be. And it's really, uh, 
you know, having <laughs> been around local politics and seeing how some of these guys act, it's just like it's mind blowing. And, you know, women feel like they can't come out and say certain things because these guys have power. I mean, that dynamic is a very real thing. That's what Me Too is about. That's there. There are legitimate problems here. And, you know, to to have it kind of come out this way. And then and see, and to kind of weaponize weaponize his supporters isn't isn't great either. So. And here's the other part of this equation too. What a lot of people need to be careful of. I mean, there are tons of stories running around about tons of people and yeah. tons of tons of not so appropriate behavior. How, how many you want? I got a I got a few of them. I got quite a few. of I'm them. I'm sure you got more than I do. Because, I mean, now I'm not the National Enquirer. But, uh, thanks, Mark. By the way, Mark Warner, thank you for the whole. You know, cheat sheet thing. Justin, are, Justin wanted to know if you'll tell us who uh, leaked the report in the cheat sheet, which uh, you can find at indiepolitics.org. <laughs> um, no, because I can't confirm it yet. Right. And something like that is you better make sure you have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed before you start naming people. I said something really mean to a legislator one day on the radio show as an intern and the mics went off and you looked at me and you flipped the thing over and he goes, you realize we have to work with these people, right? Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, this isn't like Rush Limbaugh radio. This is like real journalism. You yeah. actually have to have a relationship with people. Right. And unlike the national press who could just come in like a plague of locusts, right. you know, swarm in, devastate your crops and leave, you know, people like me, we're here. We deal with these people every day yeah and since i'm not a bitter blogger you know who spends all day or used to spend all day just writing whatever <laughs> right I, mean, I deal with these people now we treat everybody fairly and if there are some conversations that we need to have we have those conversations somewhere else right uh so yeah that it's i think curtis hill should resign because he's bad on drugs and he is uh i i, I disagree know, with him politically but but, but that's why we're not gonna happen but that's why we have Elections. Right, exactly. My guy didn't win, so he's he's Attorney General. Um, Actually, your guy didn't run anybody. I, I don't think we did, no. Because no. Attorney General is hard because you have to have a lawyer. And we knew Mark was going to run for Secretary of State. Mm. Mark Rutherford, most qualified candidate for any Libertarian Party election I've ever seen. Mark Rutherford, Secretary of State of Indiana. It's our ballot access race. Check him out. Give him money. Uh, so <laughs> that's my plug. I think, is there anything else about the Curtis Hill or the Supreme Court stuff before we start wrapping up here? Um, for more on the Curtis Hill thing, you definitely want to subscribe to the cheat sheet. We kind of walk through all the different multiple facets, multiple angles of a lot of this. And what I would recommend people do is when you read about the Supreme Court and the nominee, do not get your sources from, do not get all your information from one source. Yes. And actually, matter of fact, you know what you're probably better off doing is watching C-SPAN and watching the confirmation hearings. Someone in our group, which you can join at WeAreLibertarians.com, uh, someone posted a Vox article. Vox is left-leaning. And it was one guy going, oh, who posts anything from Vox? And it, I was so proud of my people because huh. there were 30 comments of, you tool. Because, it, like, Vox is a perfectly legitimate liberal source. You know what you're going to get. They do their homework. They source everything. You the Daily may not Signal agree with it. Is, a, is, a, is a very Republican conservative. The, the Daily Signal and uh, you know Ben Shapiro or National Review. You're going to get good stuff. Of course, something I've been getting a lot of email from lately is some play, people call Blabber Buzz. I'm like, what the uh, hell is that? Uh, but, you know, they, they try to be like conservative in the National Enquirer with attitude, and they do a really poor job. No thanks. Uh, yeah, we've got the Daily Mail. We don't need them. So, you know, the reason... Cato, these are good resources. The Rational Review Daily Digest, which uh, I, I have linked on WeAreLibertarians.com, Thomas Knapp sends out an email with about 100 stories, truncated, it's beautiful, opinion pieces. You know, that's straight news and libertarian opinion. I mean, these you have to get your information from a bunch of different places. If you're just listening to Paul Joseph Watson and Alex Jones every day, you're not really getting all of the information. Like, you have to evaluate everything. You should listen to Paul Joseph Watson. And, and actually, if you want a really good local source of information, uh, if you folks are watching or listening to us, uh, go to IndiePolitics.org, and on the top banner, you'll see a little thing that says subscribe to our daily email. Yeah. Because one of the things I do every night before I go to bed or first thing in the morning, like at 530, is I go through all the major you know, newspapers, radio stations across the state, try to find the top 12 stories uh, from across the state of Indiana, you know, government, politically oriented, and give you a summary right there every day in your mailbox. During the weekdays, it's in your mailbox by 7, weekends by 8. So the Abdul political report, huh? 
It's it's not necessarily that's more the cheat sheet. This is just more just a summary. Of, that was more of an inside yeah, joke. Yeah. Um. So, anyways, a, a healthy diet of broad opinion is really good, and I don't want echo chambers anywhere near me. And I know Abdul doesn't. And if you do that, then you're going to be less freaked out by the news. Yep. The, we're not going to have nuclear war. Like, here's why. And and this whole thing about there's going to be a civil war on the 4th of July. Really? Where? Did I miss something? <laughs> right. Seriously? I love to entertain some of those conversations, and we will have those conversations here sometimes. But, uh, you know, it's it's fun to play around I with I tell ideas. people to keep the cray-cray down to a bare minimum. That's exactly like that. right. I don't listen to Melissa Donahue for my, uh, for my news. Or anything else for that matter. Exactly you're a right. smart person. Unless it's Dom Tips. <laughs> All right, Abdul, thank you so much for joining me. Final thoughts for this episode? Uh, no, it's always good to come and hang out with you, uh, share my thoughts on the Supreme Court, as also the Attorney General. And like I said, all I ask people to do, just get your news from as many different sources as possible. And it is okay. If you're like flaming liberal or you know arch neo fascist conservative, as long as you came by and honestly and did your homework, we're cool. Right. Just join us at the Antelope Club and don't be an asshole. <laughs> Where, shameless self-promotion time. That's right. Antelope Club, 615 North Delaware. Join, be a member. <laughs> Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, you should, you really should join. I should. You really should. I should, but I also don't like smoke, so. We just hang out on the balcony. All right. I do like the balcony. Now, uh, other shameless self-promotion, where can people read your stuff, follow you on stuff? All uh, like IndiePolitics.org uh, is the main website. Also, uh, A-T-T-Y, Abdul, is me on Twitter. All my other Twitter feeds. And one day, Spangle and I got to get together and do some social media house Keeping. Every six months, he creates a new Facebook page, and I'm like, come on, yeah. what are you doing? I like seeing more of me. <laughs> I mean, those those are the main things. Also, you can read my work in the Star, the IBJ. I write a column for them once a month. Also, the Annapolis Recorder, <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah, no, you've been there forever. Been there forever. And now Chicago, too. You're branching out into Chicago. Yep, I do commentary once a week for WVON, one of the oldest urban talk radio stations in the country. I bet the mail that you get from that. Actually, the general manager loves me. Right. And and my commentary is some of the highest listened to stuff because I always, I disagree with the audience, but I make them think, and I do it right. in a very sarcastic, smart ass way. Like I just wrote a column about you might have seen guys might have seen in social media, you know these different stories about you know black people just going about their business and some white person calls the cops, right? Like the kid with the lawnmower yeah. or what is know, this white so people water, cut it out water, water or the most recent one the woman who was wearing the Puerto Rican t shirt. <laughs> And the guy came over like, you're taking over, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's going on about, you know, these are systemic patterns of racism and discrimination, and blah, blah, blah. We need to get mad and yell and scream. I was like, well, actually, no, you need to be happy because you know what? This stuff used to go on and nobody knew about it. Right. Now people are getting called out and you're seeing it because the woman who uh, called the police on the girl selling water, she had to quit her job working yeah. for a cannabis company. You know, there are consequences to asshole behavior. Yeah. So why get mad when you see it when you should be happy? Because you know what? It is now out in the open. That's exactly right. Yes. Uh, freedom is a great thing. Yep. It's also like domestic tranquility. It's not free. <laughs> All right. Well, one day we'll enter. Can I? One day we'll get you into, you know, taxation is theft. We'll, taxation we'll is not theft. We'll get you a T-shirt. Theft. We'll get you a, a bumper sticker. It'll be great. Taxation is not theft. <laughs> It is the price you people pay for civilization. If you, uh, if you don't like it, then you can always move somewhere else. <laughs> now, we can argue. Please say Somalia now. Hit every one of the cliches. Uh, there's Somalia. There's Uganda. You know, <laughs> Here today, Ghana tomorrow. You, you're going to get a lot of hate mail after this episode. Right. All right. Thanks for joining me here on We Are Libertarians. Thanks to Brandon Luke, Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, and Christy Avery for being our $100 a month subscribers. So excited that uh, uh, I, I didn't see your Rob question, Ryan Bennett. Sorry. Uh, Jason Doolittle is actually going to be in town this weekend, and uh, we're going to go shooting. We're going to go to St. Elmo's. I've de never done either of those things. He's going to be on the program here on Thursday, so I'm very excited to see um, you know, Jason and Christy Avery especially have, and, and Craig DaCosta have been tremendous supporters uh, over many, many, many years. And so I'm very excited to meet Jason in person for the first time. So tune in. That'll be a fun episode. Harry will be here. Uh, and uh, we'll be back Thursday night. I'm glad to come, kind of finally be back on my regular schedule. I've just got one more week of travel uh, at the end of this month, and then we're going to be back to our normal two-week uh, rotation here in the studio. Um, but it's been nice to have a break. Uh, <laughs> two shows, two long shows a week. I mean, it's it's it takes a lot of work. You're better than me. Yeah. Well, no, no, you're not. <laughs> I, was like, I got that audio. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rob Kendall says that he took Todd Rakita out. How much pull does Rob Kendall actually have? Ryan wants to know. 
Uh, Rob Kendall, I love him like my little brother. And if Rob Kendall says, if Rob Kendall believes it, then it probably happened in his mind. <laughs> that's exactly, that's it's a very fair point. Rob Kendall, weekend talk show host, <laughs> did not take out Todd Rakita. Uh, but we love Rob all the same. We're going to have Rob on very soon. Uh, Abdul, thanks for joining me. Hey, always a pleasure, little man. All right. We'll talk to you soon. We'll see you Thursday. Bye bye. All right. <laughs> Rob. Rob.